Um, so uh, this is a ge geologic map of the state of Texas, and this is uh, all this is the coastal plain. So if you think about how the coastal plain formed, it's basically all sedimentary rock. You know, the rivers coming down from the base of the Rockies, uh, dumping their sediment onto the coast, and it builds up, and the land basically is is uh, building out into the Gulf of Mexico. And what you need to realize is that uh, imagine this. Um, if you took a cross section of this and imagine it was a seesaw, the fulcrum of the seesaw would be right here along the coast. So as you get sediment dumped out into the shallow gulf here, that weighs a lot. And it actually pushes down on the mantle of the earth. And it's like a balloon. When you squeeze one part of the earth, it pops up in another spot. So it's not that this land, which you know can be maybe 300 feet above sea level, was it's not that the ocean was that high, it's that land is actually actually being pushed up as this area out here sinks down. So you know the sediments here are like 40,000 feet thick. So we're talking a lot, of, a lot of weight that can do that. And the point where it broke with, uh, I guess what you would call the continent itself would be, this is Balcones Fall. So uh, this is a topographic map. And basically, so what we've got when we're talking about the coastal prairie, we're talking about the youngest uh, piece of this coastal plain. Um, this is all part of the coastal plain up here, but it's higher, it's a dissected landscape. But it's this young, very flat area that is uh, dominated by grasses. And uh, this is an example of how, that coastal, how the coastal plain, how the coastal prairie formation was formed. You have rivers like the Brazos coming down. This is a 1995 photo near O'Sharon. Uh, the river changes course. You get a piece of river that's left behind, and you can see even here, um, uh, not 10 years later, most of that channel course has already been filled in with, with clay sediment from overbank flooding. And the whole coastal prairie is really made up of, of uh, uh, old river deposits overlaying on one on top of another on top of another. Here's the current uh, bra modern Brazos Delta, and you can see. Sorry. Um, Yes. yes, thank you. Yes, much better. You can see uh, old channels of the Brazos here. This is Big Slough. This is Oyster Creek. All these areas are where the river used to flow. And it's just changed course over time. And what I really wanted to show you with this photo is that you'll notice it's bright green along this old channel course. Um, as, the, as these rivers come down to the Gulf of Mexico, they basically form deltas. And the one thing that distinguishes a delta from other river valleys is that as the river hits this flat ground, it dumps its sediment out over the banks because the water slows down. The water can no, is no longer capable, doesn't have the energy to carry all that sand and clay and silt. So as the river overbanks and you get an immediate um, decrease in flow speed, you get a lot of deposition right along the banks. And so as you become coming through, as these rivers come into a deltaic environment, the high ground is actually right here where the river's building up land. So where these old river courses were actually raised versus this area between river courses, which is much lower. So you have to think it's like opposite of inland. Inland where the river is, it's down in the valley. Down on the coast where the river is, or was, it's actually raised up. And so you get a different plant community. You get this, this forest area instead of a saline prairie or marsh. And uh, just to, this is a photo of, here's Houston, Galveston Bay, this is an astronaut photo. You really do see how as the Brazos comes out of this high area along College Station and hits the flat coastal plain and forms this, it's a delta. You can see that from space. It's not really something you can pick up just driving across the landscape. And you know, how is it formed? Here's an example. This is actually from Colorado, but it's much steeper, but it really shows you in stark real world, you know, how these things are forming. As the river comes down out of the high ground, you can see it forms basically an alluvial fan. You see all these old channels where the stream once ran or, or still runs, and you see how it brought the sediment down and built up this fan. And you can see how it's basically we've got the same structure here. And here's a, a, um, a geologist's rendering of it as the river comes out of the high ground and forms these different stream channels. And notice difficult to see, but you notice it's layer after layer after layer laid on top of it, on top of one another. You have buried 
stream sediments all throughout that large fan. And that is exactly what we're sitting on today. That's how where we're at. That's how this coastal prairie formed. Uh, here's an actual map of a guy who did a uh, sediment study looking at the various ages. Here's the modern Brazos, Colorado, uh, actually the Colorado Delta here. So these are modern sediments, Holocene sediments, stuff that's been deposited since the last ice age. Here's stuff that was deposited about 100,000 years ago when the sea level was high once again. Here's stuff that was deposited about 300,000 years ago. So it's just overlapped uh, layers of riverborne sediments. Uh, and these alluvial fans or these deltas of these rivers coalesce, they run into one another. So the Brazos, the Trinity, the Brazos, uh, the Colorado, uh, the Palacios, uh, the Guadalupe, the Nueces, all those river deltas have overlain one another and coalesced along the edges and they form this very flat um, coastal plain but also very rich in a lot of the sediments are draining from up here are draining um, old marine sediments so they're very rich in clay, very fine particles a lot of clay material, a lot of alkaline material, a lot of sandy material, all different sorts of sediments um, that have created this coastal plain. Here's a old black and white photo. And I, all my photos are going to be black and white when I show you prairie landscapes because the modern landscape's gone for the most part. It's been destroyed. But if you look at these old 1930, 1940, 1950 photos, you can see stuff before it was developed. So this is like where NASA is today along Clear Lake. And you can see here's an old river course, if you, you notice that. And you see all these white dots? Those are all amoeba mounds, pimple mounds. Those are little sand dunes. So you've got this old river course. You've got the sand that was overbank flooded all along it. And then down away from the river course, the old river course, you have these low sump areas that the river never brought much sediment into. They're just very fine clay sediments that uh, as the river overbanked, the sand settled out, a little bit of clay settled out down here. And so you have a very diverse landscape as far as plants and prairies are concerned. First of all, why, why is most of this prairie? Well, because it's very clay rich. Uh, one of the other guys uh, talking about these little prairies throughout East Texas said, yeah, anywhere you got these clay outcrops, you get prairies. Because trees, bottom line is trees don't like growing on gumbo. It's either hard as a brick or it's like wet as can be, you know. And trees don't like that. They like having water all throughout the year. Grasses, they don't care. They flourish on the, in, that, in that kind of a, of a soil situation. So much of the coastal plain is uh, a lot of clay-rich sediments, very good for plant growth. It's very flat. There's very few, because it's such a cohesive clay sediment, you don't get a lot of erosional cuts through this. The water runs off the land uh, through little swales and all, but they don't make in size channels, so you don't have a lot of fire breaks. And adjacent to the coastal tall grass prairie is the saline prairie, which is extremely flammable. Uh, and being on the coast, you get a lot of lightning strikes. The combination of all that uh, results in us having a nice zone of tall grass prairie on this. Uh, actually, I, I think the best term isn't really coastal prairie because coastal, I mean coastal plain because coastal plain extends all the way to Austin. Really, what I like to describe these younger sediments along the Texas coast and Louisiana coast is as a clay plain. And it's really the um, extent of that clay plain that defines the extent of our coastal prairie. <clears throat> Here is another example. And this shows uh, an area where rivers came down, deposited a lot of sandier sediments. You can see the old stream course here. Uh, but there's something else going on in this environment. And uh, this is, okay, this is Andy's hypothesis. So I have to do some sediment work to prove this. But what I think the other formative factor that's occurring in this landscape is that when these soils get wet and they uh, become devoid of oxygen, um, there are some chemical reactions that take place that allow the clay and silt and sand particles to disassociate from one another. Basically, your um, you know, soil is made of, good soil is made up of granular and here, 
soil sediments. And under certain conditions here on the coastal plain, those uh, soil particles can disassociate, can basically dissolve in water. And uh, the clays are so very fine that they become suspended in our water. Uh, and that's, that's basically why our bayous are very frequently muddy. Uh, the, the clay particles are so small they form a colloid, which is basically where the clay is suspended in the water by the electrical charge of the water molecules. The clays, they won't settle out. They're stuck in that uh, water column until some chemical change happens to the water and the clays can once again clump and flocculate and settle out. So the clays are actually able to, they're, they're basically being dissolved off this landscape. And you can actually see that kind of in this photo here. Um, and they're running off, uh, basically running into the, off the landscape into the creeks and bayous and bays. And the, whereas the sands and silts are left behind, so over time these old meander ridges, as they're called, where the rivers ran, become sandy, more and more sand rich, and more and more elevated versus the surrounding uh, clay rich interdistributary basins. And uh, I'm hoping I'm not using too many terms here for y'all, but what you end up with after a long period of time is a prairie landscape where you have everything from these real wet, low sumps that may be like the Lake Charles clay that are dominated by switchgrass, common grass, very wet prairies, to much sandier areas with a lot of pimple mounds, a lot of these little coppice dunes where the sand has uh, blown up and formed uh, these small sand dunes across the landscape. And areas where the river channels themselves um, have been shaped by wind erosion. Remember the clay disappears, right? And you've got sand and silt left behind that can then blow around out of these formerly wet basins whenever they dry out. The, that material ends up in the surrounding landscape and you get uh, areas where you have like little sand dunes next to these nice uh, wind deflated depressions or marsh ponds and then these big deep wide shallow wet basins. And so you have, you have a development of a very a uh, diverse landscape over time. And this is a good topo map that a guy who's way smarter than me was able to take off the shelf LIDAR data, off the self shelf digital elevation models that are available for all the Texas coast. And he uh, came up with a very detailed topographic map. And you can see the old channel scar, right? The old river channel. And you can see the um, how it's been uh, shaped into Here's an old channel right here that's been shaped into these nice little circular basins. And adjacent to that, you have higher ground. These are the sandier, higher areas where sand is blown out of this channel and just blown up over the rest of the landscape and accumulated, forming these higher dunes on what were the old alluvial levees of the, um, of the original channel. And so you get a um, really cool landscape when it's left. Here's a close-up of that. You can actually see all these little dots. Those are all the little sand dunes, the little Nima mounds, versus the much larger um, sand deposits. They're actually the original banks of the of the river course, and um, uh, some of it is, is windblown as well. And so you can pick that up in LIDAR, or in, uh, not LIDAR, this is actually just other massage elevation data. Uh, and you can see real well here, see this deeper channel? That is where these clay, the clays are basically dissolving away and eroding away and running down into a uh, creek down here. Now if you were to walk, even if, even if you were standing in this, if you were to walk across that, it would actually look almost perfectly flat to you. But the plant community across this changes drastically. Even an inch of elevation difference or a slight change in soil texture on this coastal prairie will give you a different a change in the plant community. And this is what it looks like happening in real time. So here you have the, uh, a little marsh area in a, on an upland um, flat. And uh, you see how muddy that water is. This is in winter. Those clays have disassociated with the other soil particles. They're here sitting in the water as a colloid. It rains enough, you get run off, this uh, runs off and you actually form these little swales. And you see how muddy that water is. Here's a close-up of what this looks like when it dries out. And you notice it almost looks like the ground is dissolved. 
Some of this is uh, from uh, little nematodes and other worms in the soil, but a lot of this structure you see here is just actually the ground is, it's almost like it's dissolved or it's melted away. It's those clays that are running off and uh, leaving behind more the, the sands and silts. Over time, um, this, is a, this is one of the old river courses here. Over time, the, that shape of the channel itself gets totally obliterated through uh, wind and water erosion. And what's left behind is just a string of somewhat circular, although they can be really weird shaped ponds. These are the prairie potholes, or that's the term I've, I've heard used, prairie pothole. Actually, I've talked to ranchers, they mostly call these centibene ponds because they almost all have uh, what they call centibene or sesbane and dromundii growing in them. Uh, and if you're in Louisiana, these are called platens, which are basically plates or flats. Uh, there's a lot of different names for them, but an unplowed, unfarmed prairie uh, on the coastal plain is going to be just rife with these little uh, depressional wetlands and then the little white Nema mounds. And then it, again, you can see that example of how, um, of how the land looks like it's just being drained away. If you go up into the older, sediments like this is part of the Katy Prairie. So the other photos I've been showing you are all Beaumont, so they're like less than 300,000 years old. This stuff here can be up to about a million and a half years old. Over time the river courses are just, they're totally gone and you're just left with um, all these little circular potholes all over the landscape. And you've got to remember this, this Katy Prairie, this has lost about 20 feet of the top of the original uh, top layer of sediments is all, already eroded off this older landscape. This is about 80 feet in elevation. But if you remember way back one of the first slides I showed you, that deltaic area is built up, it's like river channel on top of river channel on top of river channel. It's all layered. And so as one layer gets stripped off, there's more of the good stuff underneath. And so you keep getting the uh, continual reformation of these uh, depressional wetlands in, in this really cool landscape. And there's some cool stuff. This is uh, the Hockley Salt Mine is located here. You got the Hockley Salt Dome, and as that salt dome pushed up, it impounded a really large, about a 150 plus acre lake. It was actually called Lake Peter Donnelly. And when you look on the land itself, this is what you're going to see. This is unplowed prairie at Brazos Bend State Park. Here's my boss standing in one of these, one of those circular depressional, so those, one of those black spots on the photo. This is one of them right here. It doesn't look like much, does it? That's what you got, all right? It's also very subtle. But you can see you've got nice arrowhead, Sagittaria here. Here's one of the little pimple mounds. This might have like a big blue stem on it or even um, Side oats grama, in between you may have like long spike triads, switchgrass, gama grass. And uh, this is all within one of those old channel scars on those, those higher elevated banks, the old alluvial banks with the sandy material, that's what the trees are growing on out here. That's, what, that's the edge of that. And uh, people often describe the coastal prairie as uh, large open grasslands with mots of trees. Those mots of trees weren't randomly located on the landscape. Those occurred on the uh, uh, mostly the, the sandier deposits along those old river courses. And so here we're looking down one of those old river channels and you see the trees on either side. This is after a burn and you can see the marsh that's occupying that old river channel and you can actually see how, how it is raised up on the edge. Now if you were to dig into this you'd have a nice uh, loam with clay underneath. If you were to dig into this here it's just like pure sand. It's a very fine, even grain, which kind of te uh, tells you it's a wind deposited, um, a very fine sandy material. And you get some neat stuff. You get marshes, you get little pine trees growing on the sand next to it. Uh, really cool landscape. Here again, uh, one of those depressional old channel features uh, with the sand sandy banks along it, uh, some trees, some of it's just high prairie. So when you're walking across the prairie, this is where you're going to find like big blue stem, right? Big blue stem in between, little blue stem, a little lower, long spike triads dominated prairie, a little lower, it's actually going to be marsh. 
And the total elevation change here is maybe three or four feet. Uh, but the soil texture change, you can go from a um, very alkaline area where um, the water that soaks into the sand and it hits the clay that the sand was deposited on and weeps out on the edge, it evaporates, it leaves a lot of calcium, a lot of potassium behind. And so you get a, a very alkaline soils right on this edge where they wet in the dry meat. And in that area you get some really cool uh, little plants that only a botanist like Jason can get um, excited about. I mean little rushes and things that are just like, you know, I can't identify them. You need a microscope almost to identify them or you need to be really good. Uh, and you get um, sometimes uh, adjacent to these larger channel scars you actually get a continuous dune that forms. It's not just little Mima mounds. And in those areas, you get really cool, you can see that here, you see how this is right adjacent to the wet area. So the clay, the clays are leaving this landscape, and this landscape is slowly getting deeper and deeper over time. Uh, when these areas would be, would totally dry out and they're exposed because of fire, or because of grazing, uh, the sand that's left behind after the clay leaves can get blown into the adjacent vegetation here. You think about wet ponds, you know, when they dry out, they have a bare bottom that can then be eroded by the wind versus adjacent to it, it's always going to be uh, covered in grass. And so that's where the set of this, the wind blowing stuff ends up. Here you can see little mounds, little pimple mounds. They're all over the place. Right here, here, here. You get really neat stuff like you get, this is a glass lizard. So this is a sand loving lizard that you'll find anywhere you have nice deep sands. Uh, like at the Outwater Prairie Chicken Refuge. But here at Brazos Bend you'll find those animals right next to the marsh because you got a little sandy mound right next to the water. So it's really pretty awesome landscape. <clears throat> so who was in that one talk who knows what that bird is? There you go. Excellent. We can even get beavers out in the prairie. There's enough trees in those. This is from San Jacinto, believe it or not. Uh, and these prairies are separated by the modern river valleys. These modern river valleys have a different sediment in them, a different hydrology, and for the most part they're forested. And uh, so the prairie vegetation is occurring uh, on the older um, Pleistocene sediment, so stuff that's from like the last ice age and younger, I mean older, versus the stuff that's 10,000 years or less, was forested. I'm just going to show you some different pictures from the coastal prairie. Um, this is out at Sheldon where we did a burn. Uh, very wet, so this is one of those uh, in between the old river courses where you've got the nice low valley. This is the kind of stuff you get. Is um, switchgrass and gama grass and uh, even though this has been impounded and you've got cypress trees here there was there was cypress out on this prairie originally it was just restricted to a bayou channel uh, and you do get some of these old channel channel areas are totally forested this is a red maple swamp uh, nut all oak swamp and you get areas where you have these very clayey sediments and then you have the sand, sandier sediments next to it and even the little Mima Mound areas. As you go east and we get more and more rainfall, any of those sandier soils, the lighter textured soils are going to have trees on them. And so you start to get what folks call a savanna, which isn't where you have like trees with grass growing underneath. It's really big patches of grass with patches of trees in, in it. Um, Buttermilk racer, it's cool. So I <laughs> this is out at Sheldon Lake where we've got uh, another nice, very clayey opening adjacent to sandier sediments, and this opening here is also very alkaline, and so you have a nice prairie opening there, surrounded by pine forest. And uh, once you get out onto the barrier islands, it's a completely different system where you have very deep sandy soils, um, but because it's adjacent to saline prairie next to the bay. Uh, it burns a heck of a lot and so the result is a nice uh, prairie. Now some of these similar situations, especially further down on the coast, you'll get uh, live oak and red bay um, woodland mots uh, 
interspersed within the prairie. It's just pretty, especially after you do you do a burn. And here's a again you get these nice um, wind deflated ponds and uh, some really cool birds sometimes, fork tail, fly catcher. And what happened to all this landscape for the most part, it's like gone, right? So that's why I'm showing you black and white photos because it doesn't, they don't exist today for the most part. So uh, originally a lot of the ranchers would drain these. Um, and you see the, um, what the rancher is doing is he's making his ditches. These ponds are all forming within that old paleo channel, the Brass River in this case. And the farmer was smart, he's just connecting pond to pond following that old channel because that's where the lowest ground is, the easiest stuff to drain. It means he's got to dig less dirt. Uh, of course, nowadays it's been converted to rice farming and development. Um, and uh, the land has been completely leveled in, in most cases. So all of this, this geological legacy that form this very diverse prairie landscape for the most part is gone now. And what I realized is that um, the subsoil somewhat follows the original topography of the uh, land surface. And so we're trying to restore these landscapes. You want to restore some topographic diversity to them. And the first thing folks tried to do was um, just dig holes in it. You know, let's make the ponds again. Let's just make some ponds. But if you dig a hole on what was formerly upland, you very quickly get into a clay subsoil. It isn't very good for growing much at all. So uh, what I realized is if you can take these old photos and find where the wetlands used to be, and that's where you do your digging, you're going to, in some cases, expose the original buried wetland marsh topsoil. Um, but in all cases, you're going to have an uh, area where you can dig out and not hit that clay subsoil because it's going to be deeper below this and um, take what was formerly uplands and, and just restore that to tall grass prairie. Five minutes? Yeah. Thank you. Of course, you got to get engineers involved. So Ducks Unlimited, one of the few engineering groups that understand uh, what we're trying to do. We're not trying to build just a farm pond. And they um, actually engineered the resurrection of these old Depressional wetlands that had been filled in when, the, when this land had been farmed. This is at Sheldon Lake State Park, and uh, all the prairies there had been land level for rice farming. So we're going into an area that's absolutely flat. You'll notice this is 43.5. 43.5. I mean, it's extremely flat. It's been land level with laser level. So we're going in and we're actually resurrecting those old pothole wetlands. And uh, this is what it looked like. This had been uh, farmed just that year before. Um, the guys, the way they're doing it now is they set up a laser level. They've got a tractor pulled by a uh, trip pulling a belly scraper with another level line. He's got a computer in his cab. He's got that design, which is a uh, GIS, you know, he's got that design loaded into his computer. He's got a GPS in his tractor cab connected to his computer. So the computer knows where he's at. The computer knows how deep that is supposed to be dug down to, and it's telling this guy here, the computer is basically, the belly scraper knows what its current elevation is by the laser level, and the computer is telling it how deep to dig it. So all the dude is doing is just driving around in circles, and the computer is digging it all. And so you can resurrect these very complex landscapes. At this point, um, we're only digging out the wetlands, and you can make pretty sharp turns and all. Um, so we get volunteers to go in there and plant them, and this is uh, after just like, I think, a uh, single growing season. This is after a few growing seasons, and then this is what it looks like, uh, I think within about four years. It's basically indistinguishable from, from the native wetlands. Pretty awesome. If you burn it or graze it, somehow open it up, you're going to get a lot of ducks and geese. Um, tree ducks, which is weird now. The tree ducks are all breeding out on the prairies. The model ducks are gone. We have tree ducks nesting out in the grass. Uh, the uplands landscape, we've still got plenty of remnant prairies in this area. So we actually hired Native American seed to harvest. 
off of Remnant Prairie, um, rather than just uh, purchasing seed, we get some stuff harvested locally. And uh, we're using that to drill seed into the upland areas, and you can see it germinates quite well when it rains. Uh, we're getting adding diversity by having volunteers hand collect seed and grow it out in a greenhouse situation and uh, trying to get uh, additional diversity. Here you see the guys actually planting those out in the prairie. And the result is we're getting some pretty nice um, areas. This is at San Jacinto. I show this to all the parks and wildlife guys because they don't want, they don't know what prairie is, you know. I mean, they're just like, they take care of the people at the park and uh, uh, they just want to know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I show them this picture and they're like, oh, ooh, it's pretty, you know. And meanwhile, I'm like grinding my teeth because what they don't realize, what I do, is that about 40% of that is lawn spike tritons, about 60% is basic grass, which is an invasive. I've got to take care of that. That's a nice picture. Um, out of Galveston Island State Park, we're doing something different where this was, had been overgrazed, so the grasses are gone, so we're just reintroducing the grasses. The forest community is still pretty healthy. Some areas on our state parks, we're doing nothing other than shredding the tallow, and the prairie is basically coming back on its own. And to maintain all these prairies, we do a lot of prescribed fire. If you burn it at the right time of the year, it does kill tallow. And bald cypress are amazingly tolerant to fire. People wouldn't think that, but they are. Uh, and yes, you can kill bacterias with the fire. Only uh, maybe 60% of the bacterias re-sprouted, but getting rid of 40% is pretty good for one uh, single burn. So that's it. That's what we're doing. What I want to try to emphasize is, is our prairie restoration and kind of understanding the prairie. You really got to understand the underlying geology. That that explains why the soil, what soils you have, what topography you have, and it, and it kind of clued us into a, a somewhat of a new restoration technique. A friend of mine said, um, "Geology is the." Um, underpinning of ecology. I think he, I think he was right. Are there any questions? I think we've got maybe a couple minutes. You said that your slopes were alkaline because the calcium had been moved out. Yeah, so these are all marine-derived sediments, right? Yeah, coming from it's all Alyssi in the Beaumont, yeah. Yeah, from like the Permian red beds, all the, all the inland, you know, limestone that's being dissolved inland. Those are all old marine sediments. So they're very rich in things like calcium and potassium and magnesium. On your, on your little sandy mounds, yes. do you see a change in pH then? Yes. They become, they become more acidic. The mounds are, are acidic, yes. Yeah, the as you go down deeper, it becomes alkaline. And, then, and, then and on the edge of the mound, so you, on the edge of the mound, it's going to be like 8.2 pH. Yeah. Is that, is, is, then, is that then higher pH than your wetland? Yeah, the wetland is like 5.9. Okay, so the wetlands are acidic too. Very much so, yes. That's 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 cool. It is. It's a, Dr. Wilding at A and M kind of worked all of that out, and uh, you get uh, like at the base of the mounds and at the interface there, you get a lot of calcium carbonate concretions forming, and you don't, you know, in the wetter areas or in the upper mound itself. It's all really cool. And the mounds, how these mounds form, it's very controversial, but. You know, we can talk about gophers all the time, but it's weird. It's like, okay, why are the mounds bigger as you go down south where it's drier and you get more sand moving? Are the gophers bigger? <laughs> why is it just more why sand? Is, why is it only on low slope areas and not on higher slope areas? Just, yeah. yeah, I mean, you can go on and on. Well, the thing here, okay, so I will say there's many reasons these mounds have formed. They form all over the world. There's a lot of different ways they form, but in this landscape, they've got this new technique now where the geologists can actually age how old this grain of sand is. How long has it been, how long has it been since that sand has been exposed to sunlight? Yeah. Yeah. And sure enough, these mounds and other sandy mantles all in this area date back to a very short period of formation when this area was what's called the mid-Holocene optimum, where we had much hotter summers, much drier summers. So those wet areas went extremely bone dry during the summer and then were very wet during the winter. So you had a much exaggerated wetting and drying and much greater droughts, a lot more the fires were devastating. And that's when those mounds were formed. But gophers they'd still be forming them today. So <laughs> and then why did the gophers dig out the holes, you know, the, the depressions, you know, why I mean there's we can argue about it, but 
Not right now, we don't have time. So, <laughs> so you mentioned the top 20 feet of the Katy Curry as you wrote it. Is that, is that recent from the mid Palestinian? What's that, that now? The, you said the top 20 feet? Yes, it's been eroded away. So no, the Katy Curry, that's what's called the Lissy Formation. So that's all about, uh, I want to get this right. Um, Lissy's early place to see. Uh, yeah, early less to... Less than a million years. Probably. Yeah, up to maybe 700,000 years old. And then there's like a, they say the Beaumont is 400,000 years old. So there's like 300,000 of in-between stuff, you know. But it's basically whenever we had a high sea level stand or near high sea level stand during interglacials and as we're going into glacials, um, uh, you would get these big deposition events. And so you, you age it according to, um, you know, the in glacial, interglacial epics. One more question, Joe, you had a question? Okay, thank you, appreciate your time.